I'm teaching basic painting and beyond, and I'm just about to do a, a demonstration of painting over a grisaille underpainting that was done on a panel. Um, this was the way early oil paintings were done in the early Renaissance. So I'm going to be laying down a glaze that's created out of liquid painting medium and transparent earth red paint. And I'm going to lay that down. It's called an imprimatura which is an Italian word, obviously, <laughs> meaning your, the coating over which you paint, it can be either dry or wet, depending on what technique you're using. In this particular project, we're painting into a wet and pretty much wet. So the first thing I need to do is mix it, getting my solvent ready here. And I'm going to take a soft brush and try to mix up the proper value of this. And you need to mix up enough to cover the whole board. I'm only actually going to be covering a small part of my board. My students will be covering their whole board and then we'll be blotting the background with some um, telephone book paper, which is called Tonking and was invented by Henry Tonks, who was the director of the Slade School in the early 20th century. I'm going to go over my pair and it should instantly look like a pear. <laughs> and I'm going to go into my background, but I'm going to stop in the middle. But I am going to cover the whole area. And this is just about the right value. This is what we're looking for. Mm. And what we did last week, we, we painted with black and white, and we, we painted our pears and established um, our shape, our composition, which is very simplistic at this point and um, our form, the light and shadow. And this is what is characteristically done in a grisaille painting. This is why this is the easiest form of oil painting, because you establish all of these things in, in a monochromatic way first. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take some pieces of this and just blot it lightly. I want to leave some of the paint in the background so that it mixes in with the paint that we paint with. This lesson is partly in using a limited palette to create harmony in a painting. I think I'm going to mix a little bit of Naples yellow with some warm cadmium yellow and start painting it into the illuminated area of the pear. Now, I usually <clears throat> I'm not a person who paints using brush strokes. I usually prefer to blend in my painting, so I will usually lay down paint um, in any direction, just filling in the area that I'm used, interested in painting. I'm going to add a little tiny bit of red to this. to mix up some of my background color. Ooh, thank you. <clears throat> and because it's a tint, I'm going to start out with some white. And it's pretty easy. It's pretty much a no-brainer as far as mixing the color is concerned. You notice I did add a little tiny bit of liquid to that just because I have to mix a lot of it. So I'm going to take some liquid and some of my Windsor Green and mix the color that's kind of dark. So I'm going to add some more. That area behind the pear is definitely influenced by the light. Because it's a tungsten light, it's got a yellow pinkish cast, so I'm going to pick up a tiny bit of this maple's yellow because that's going to influence the color of the uh, background. And I'm going to go ahead and put this in there. Tiny bit of blending on the um, here right now. Blend this color up with this one. And pull this down and do this. Also, what I want to do is take another brush, a soft brush and go along my edges here because I don't want it to look like it's cut out. I'm going to soften my edge here. 
what I'm doing now is painting the proximity shadow. And then I'm going to paint a little bit of the foreground. The foreground is even lighter than the background, and it has more Naples yellow in it because it's receiving more light. And that goes right up to the, the um, proximity shadow. As you can see, it also picks up a little bit of the color underneath. All of these things work together to create a very sophisticated painting that most beginners would actually not be able to do without the limitations placed on you by having a limited palette. What I'm doing is I'm resting my hand on this paintbrush because I want to define this a little bit. There's nothing wrong with having a well-placed line here and there. I also want to paint this stem. And then the shadow itself is a duller version, but lighter of the actual color that the uh, hair is lying on. It's not that visible, actually, if you look at it. It disappears as it goes away. It seems to be kind of a cold highlight in here. This comes down on the, on the neck of the pear. I'm just using a very, very soft brush. There's also some reflected light, doesn't really have a whole lot of recognizable color, so you could use something fairly neutral. And you don't want it to be as bright as the de direct light, so you could mix it in a little bit with the color that's already there. Now I can also do things like this and leave some of that orange showing, or I can press down less hard as I go up away from my pears so that my background color becomes less distinct. And that can create actually something very beautiful in your painting. You do not have to slavishly cover the whole background of your painting with exactly the same color, hue, and value of this whitish green, you know, green and white. You can leave some of the color showing through. It can actually make it very beautiful. Now you can also take liberties with the color. For instance, you'll see that if I do this, how beautiful that is. How that brings out the, the orange. That is, that is not exactly the color that's up there. And the drawing part is taken care of in the grisaille, which is the black and white part. And then it's finished in the painted part.